History Explained is a channel I've recommended to my viewers before. It's a fantastic channel which produces mini biographies of ancient figures. In one of their more recent videos, they covered a favourite Egyptian figure of mine, Akhenaten, the pharaoh who briefly but profoundly changed Egypt's religious culture. In History Explained's video, the following assertion is made. As Akhenaten is the first monotheist on record, it is theorized that the pharaoh had a profound and lasting impact on world civilization. Akhenaten's radical religious reform is thought to have been a tremendous influence on the later developments of monotheistic religious faith. And, well, this isn't an uncommon view, but I don't happen to agree. And I thought, well, a response video might be a good way to gauge my audience's interest in the subject in general. So, what is monotheism? Did Akhenaten subscribe to it? And if so, is he responsible for the existence of this? There are a couple of things to cover before I get started. Number one, I'm taking a position contrary to History Explains position, but this isn't a takedown video. I love History Explains work and the video I'm responding to is truly excellent. In fact, if you want more context for what this video is about, you should go and watch their video before coming back to mine. There's a link in the description. Number two, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is in areas I will be revisiting in much greater detail in other videos. So while I'm going to try to put in enough detail here that everyone can follow my line of thinking, by necessity, I am going to leave a fair bit out. Definitely let me know in the comments if I mention anything in some detail that you'd like to see a more complete overview of another time. Number three, History Explained does not claim a strong causal link between Akhenaten and the development of the Abrahamic religions. They never claim there's any evidence to support such a link, and in fact they do go out of their way to say that evidence for the link isn't strong. However, they do put forward the idea that this link exists, and their video concludes with the profound suggestion that Akhenaten had a radical influence on the development of later monotheistic faiths. So I don't have any qualms whatsoever with the intellectual honesty or the academic integrity of History Explained and their research. It all seems to be perfectly above board, but I draw different conclusions from the same evidence and I want to explain why. So. Like I said, Akhenaten's reign and the years that followed, which Egyptologists call the Amarna period for reasons that will become clear, is one of my favourite areas of Egyptology. If you've just watched History Explains video and don't feel like sitting through another explanation of essentially the same facts, you can skip to here, but I won't be taking long. Akhenaten inherited rulership of Egypt from his very successful father, Amenhotep III, during a time of political tension between the throne of the pharaoh and the increasingly powerful priests of the Theban cult of Amun, who had been growing in power since the beginning of the 18th dynasty, to the point where some believed they were rivals for the pharaoh himself. Either for this political reason or because of genuine religious conviction, Akhenaten moved his court from Thebes to a new city called Horizon of the Aten at a site that nowadays is called Amarna. Here, a god called the Aten, the physical manifestation of the sun, was revered above all others, with Akhenaten and his queen Nefertiti as the Aten's prophets, his direct earthly representatives. Over time, this revolutionary religion would gain fervour, to the point where the Aten was a supreme, all-encompassing deity. The other gods became either aspects of the Aten or were completely proscribed. Most notably, images of our moon were scrubbed from monuments and from the king's own personal name. Name. Like his father, he was born Amenhotep, but changed his name to Akhenaten in his fifth year as king. The Aten became more prominent until, debatably, it became the only allowed god in Egypt. 
this phase didn't last long. In the reign of Akhenaten's son, Tutankhamun, the Aten cult was dismantled and removed from history, and Amun was returned to his former place as Amun-Ra, creator, sun god, and divine sponsor of the pharaohs. The question, did Akhenaten invent monotheism, isn't a simple factual question we can answer by consulting evidence. It has multiple components, some historical, some philosophical, and all requiring a bit of interpretation. I'm going to break the question down into two component questions that I think matter the most. The first is, was Akhenaten's monotheism of the same sort that the Abrahamic religions ultimately adopted? For the record, I don't think Akhenaten was a true monotheist. I think he was a monolater, who acknowledged other deities but exclusively worshipped one. For those not quite sure what the definitions are that I'm using, monotheism concerns the existence or non-existence of a single sovereign deity. Why did I say non-existence? Well, look at the dreaded cohort known as online atheists and tell me that they aren't operating within a monotheistic paradigm. They don't believe in any gods, but they particularly don't believe in the Abrahamic Daji God. They are atheists, but they are by and large responding to a particular religious paradigm. In an analogous way, I think Akhenaten was a monotheist only through the paradigm of polytheism. He believed in one god as a response to the common belief in several. And there's a word for that, monolatry. Monolatry, put very simply, is when a culture solely gives worship to a single deity, but doesn't outright deny the existence of other deities. The second of the Ten Commandments, of which there are eleven, is monolatrous in nature. You will have no other other gods before me. This is not denying that there are other gods, is it? It's just commanding that you ignore all the other gods. And even when we hear the words, behold Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, all we're being told is that this particular god is unitary and solitary, not that he's without peer outside of the Hebrew paradigm. Now, we might find the differences between monotheism and monolatry pretty academic, but the first few generations of Christians spent a lot of time killing each other trying to reconcile the paradox of the unity of God with the idea of a holy trinity. Now, we don't have time to unpack all of that! <laughs> That leaves us with the question, was Akhenaten's monotheism of a matching type of the sort that took hold among the ancient Hebrews? Our second question will be, assuming Akhenaten was a monotheist of a corresponding type, was his monotheism sufficiently influential that we can give it a part to play in the birth of the Abrahamic religions? Again, we'll have to look at historical evidence as the foundation of our answer, and we'll have to resort to some speculation. On this channel, I've consistently asserted that to invent something, you have to both innovate it and be the reason that others adopted it. Louis Le Prince came up with his film camera before Edison patented one, but it was Edison's that gave rise to the American film industry and ultimately Hollywood culture, not Le Prince's. So while we would be right to say that Le Prince innovated the film camera before Edison, we can't really call him the father of cinema. With that in mind, I have at no point ever implied that to qualify as an inventor, the thing you invent couldn't exist without you. Le Prince and Edison were both inventing the same thing at similar times. If one of them had never existed, the other one would have come up with it. I don't think that History Explained, or any Egyptologist for that matter, would ever be so bold as to assert that without Akhenaten there could be no Judaism, no Christianity, no Islam. So the question is more, was Akhenaten an Edison or a Le Prince? Was his monotheism contributory to the monotheism we Europeans are so familiar with? Or was it a parallel, going in the same direction but not connected? One of the reasons the link between Aten and Yahweh is so tempting is that there are historical parallels to their origins. Both were gods in pantheons, who rose first to prominence, then to dominance, and then to uniqueness. 
Both were born out of a cultural feeling of necessity. In the Artin's case, the need to reclaim pharaonic authority through the traditional link to the sun. In the case of Yahweh, a response to the Babylonian captivity, wherein many Israelites were exiled from their homeland following a Babylonian conquest of Judea. Obviously, another explanation for the rise of a new religion is genuine religious belief. I'm not pretending that isn't a factor, I'm not ignoring that possibility, but it isn't possible to gauge the sincerity of a person's or culture's religious faith, particularly if that person or culture existed a very long time ago. So all that's honestly available to me are the external factors that allow the religion to come into force. These historical factors are pretty undeniable, but if you prefer, you can choose between saying that these factors explain why this culture adopted the truth, or that these factors explain why the culture adopted a new paradigm of religious thought whose truth is a separate question. As a humanist, I can only honestly stick to the latter. Monotheism makes a lot of demands of a god. Suddenly, the multitudinous duties handled by a large group are now the responsibility of a single entity. This entity, almost by definition, must be exceedingly powerful. Not necessarily all-powerful, but certainly beyond the scope of the sorts of gods who are found in the beds of their friends' wives. Yahweh, for example, was married when he was the head of a pantheon, but lost all personalising traits once he became a supreme being, outside of the human conceptions of love, time and ability. God doesn't have children. He's a bachelor, and very angry. Idolatry, the creation and worship of images of a god, poses no problem for most pantheons, but for an abstract being like a supreme deity, it's very dangerous. You can't make them look like people, otherwise they might be assumed to have human motivations, they might be assumed to have human flaws. Ra was a man, often with a falcon's head. The Artan, who was taken to be Ra's physical extension in the mortal world, was nothing of the kind. It was a sun orb, sending forth rays of light, life and truth. It didn't have feet, a head and a face. Both of these gods, Aten and Yahweh, had to be defined as mysterious, distant figures, speaking only through certain chosen prophets. Otherwise, again, your supreme being becomes too relatable, too interested in human affairs, and it becomes awkward to explain why the world shouldn't be perfect with that god in charge. On the face of it, these two gods appear to have very similar roles in their respective societies. They have very similar real-world origins, and they even seem to be theologically comparable. And, well, it would be easy to imagine Egyptian religious thought having a direct influence over that of Judea. Egypt had ruled over that region of the world, directly or indirectly, on and off since the Old Kingdom thousands of years before the emergence of Judaism or the formation of the Israelite nationality. It would be the easiest thing in the world for an idea as profound and earth-shattering as the existence of a single sovereign deity to be passed from the pharaoh to those over whom he had tremendous influence. Here's the problem. That all being the case actually makes a direct lineage from Artanism to Yahwism to Judaism less plausible. Akhenaten's reign predates the beginnings of Hebrew monotheism by several centuries. Egypt dispensed with its monotheistic experiment before 1300 BCE, but at this time, the ancient Israelites were affirmatively polytheists. Even into the 400s BCE, Yahweh was seen by some as the head of a pantheon, although by this time, the idea of Yahweh as the sole god of the Hebrews was more or less the mainstream. From what I gather, and I won't pretend to be a scholar of the history of religion, it's generally considered that the Babylonian exile of the 6th century BCE is the beginning of the final transition of the Hebrew religion to monotheism, after a few centuries of increased Yahwist supremacy. Sigmund Freud, the insufferable biological father of psychiatry who showed up to its bar mitzvah uninvited, proposed quite seriously that Moses was a priest of the Aten, a disciple of Akhenaten, who fled Egypt as the Aten cult was being purged and spread the idea of monotheism to the ancient Hebrews. It's a nice story, a neat little idea, but fortunately, a few things don't add up. One of them is that the historicity of Moses is dubious, but even ignoring that, the dates don't work. 
if Moses was contemporary with Akhenaten, as Freud suggested, or even with Ramesses the Great, as DreamWorks suggested, then his attempt to introduce monotheism to the Israelites would appear to have failed, because they didn't pick up monotheism for several hundred years after Moses' death. For me, the timeline problem is the nail in the coffin of the idea that Artanism gave rise to Judaism. For the two gods to be so similar in concept really has to be for one of two reasons, direct influence or convergent evolution. As far as I'm concerned, for direct influence to be a plausible explanation, the two monotheisms have to be either contemporary or within a very short time of each other. Akhenaten's religion didn't last very long, and was barely established within Egypt, let alone in its wider sphere of influence, and it was actively deleted from the historical record after his death. As the evidence stands right now, there's no plausible means of transmission for his monotheism to be imitated by the ancient Hebrews, and that leaves us with convergent evolution. Two things ending up with a similar form despite being, at best, very, very distantly related, and they end up with the same form simply because they came about in similar conditions. Dolphins and ichthyosaurs infamously share an uncanny number of features, but they're nowhere near genetically related. Their nearest common ancestor was probably hundreds of millions of years ago and wouldn't have resembled either of them. It's just that ichthyosaur features and dolphin features are both really good sets of features to have if you live underwater. So there. Artanism, for all that it's very significant in Egyptology, wasn't very significant in world history. It didn't have the contemporary influence needed to spread outside of Egypt, and we can see this by the fact that it just doesn't seem to have done so. The similarities between Akhenaten's monotheism and the monotheism of the Abrahamic religions are most likely the result of certain things that are core ideas of monotheism. A monotheistic god needs to be very powerful to be the only god, and that power means it has to be an abstract and distant being shrouded in mystery. Akhenaten didn't introduce the irresistible idea of monotheism to a waiting world. In fact, his idea died not long after he did, and came about separately in various parts of the world at different times. This is, I'm afraid, nothing more than an iconic example of something being the earliest known case, but not the first. If anyone on the History Explained team is watching this, I hope you feel I did the subject justice, and even if I didn't convince you, I gave you a few things to chew over. Thank you all for staying with it for this long. I, I know it's a bit of a high concept topic, but honestly, I hope it sparked some interest in the history and the ideas involved. I also hope that everyone watching this will go and watch more History Explained videos, because they're honestly great. Until next time, my fellow armchair Egyptologists, Life, prosperity, and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community. There's an invite link in the description.